Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Mission Matters. My name is Adam Torres, and if you'd like to apply to be a guest on the show, just head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. All right, so today's guest is James Herenchar, and he's CEO of Response Marketing Group. Jim, welcome to the show. Thanks, Adam. Good to be here. All right, man. So uh, I'm excited to pick your brain today. We're going to talk about how to utilize data to influence behavior. A lot of business owners, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of execs that listen to this show. And let's just just all be up front. We love data. <laughs> that is if we like making money. So we're going to we're going to get into that and uh, and more. But before we do, we'll start this episode the way that we start them all with what we like to call our Mission Matters Minute. So, Jim, at Mission Matters, our aim and our goal is to amplify stories for entrepreneurs, executives, and experts. That's what we do. Jim, what mission matters to you? Yeah, I would say, Adam, for us, um, you know, probably a year ago, we set out to, to try to discover a holy grail, helping all companies leverage data better to get a ROI. Uh, I think what we found is that we want everyone to know that no matter what your size of your company is, you don't have to be super large to be mm -hmm. able to deep, get deep into data. You can be the smallest type of company with nothing more than a, a bunch of names in an Excel spreadsheet. But uh, we believe you can still be highly successful. So we want to partner with clients that allow us to be able to work with them in learning a lot more about who their customers are, how they can use that data to be successful and measure uh, their, their uh, advertising spend. So first off, great to have you on. And to me, this is, I mean, I've, I've done a lot of episodes, a lot of shows, but when we were getting ready for this, I was kind of like chomping at the bit because I'm like, man, I get to pick this guy's brain. And for everybody listening, they're like, what is Adam talking about now? You like this business been around for what, 38 plus years, like response marketing. You've been so Talk to me a little bit about that and the and the roots of that, because it's like that's that's a big deal. Like you've seen I, in the last you know 40 years, let's call it the, for decades of transition, not just to digital, but way before digital for all the for all the youngins here. There was a time before digital. So yeah. talk to me a little bit about about that. Uh, that makes that makes me feel old, Adam. No, nah, it's uh, not about making. I try not to do it. I was, I was, I threw out the horse and buggy analogy. Like I was going to be like, "What well, were we selling stamps?" And no, I'm just. <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> Come on, man. Go ahead, please. Um, no, no, thank you for that. Yeah, October will be 38 years uh, yes. for Response Marketing Group. And to your point. Congrats, uh, man. That's amazing. Well, First I appreciate off. It. Yeah. I, I actually joined the firm in 1994. So, yeah. so they had been around eight years before my arrival. Uh, and our primary audience was financial services companies because mm -hmm. uh, those that are almost uh, as old as me. Can, can remember a day in which you would show up in your mailbox every day and there was a direct mail piece from probably a financial institution, a bank of some sort that you yeah. never heard of before that was offering you a, a line of credit mm -hmm. or a home equity loan. Yeah. Back in the late 80s and basically all through the 90s, uh, really, there were only two primary channels for marketing and advertising in what we call below the line, right? So there mm -hmm. was radio, TV, billboard, and all of that. But below the line advertising was was really focused almost exclusively on um, telemarketing and direct yeah. mail. Uh, and so back in that late 80s to, to late 90s, uh, we were mailing uh, hundreds of pieces of direct mail on behalf of financial services companies. And the reality mm -hmm. is what we brought to the table, our USP, if you will, was predictive analytics, right? And so mm -hmm. in a world where people would say, I'm gonna mail, we'll make it simple math. I'm gonna mail a million pieces of direct mail to yeah. try to get credit card acquirers, uh, new credit card customers. We said, well, why don't we take existing clients? Why don't we build a clone or a lookalike model so that we can identify those that already have your product? And then let's overlay that on your broader acquisition prospect market. Rather mm -hmm. than mail a million pieces, you can make mail 600,000 pieces. You can get a higher response rate and a lower cost per acquisition. Yeah. That's really what was the underpinnings and foundational success of RMG. And so looking at like um, and I, those early days, what made I want to stay there a little bit longer because I see some similarities to digital, but I want to make that connection because I don't think it's intuitive. Like what made the data so robust and what made direct mail so effective then? And actually, some for some things, it's still super, super effective. But what made the, the data so ro robust? Like what made it work? 
Well, I, I think intuitively we all would say, well, there's certain criteria that are always going to be highly predictive, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're selling a financial services product, income, net worth, whether you're yeah. a homeowner, whether you already have a credit card, all of those things are well known. Mm -hmm. um, to your point, I think what's very different in today's world is that's become a lot harder because we have 30 year olds or older that don't own a home. Um, yeah. Some people are uh, uh, credit and risk averse, so they don't mm -hmm. even have a credit card. Uh, so having those type of criteria to make audience selections has become harder mm -hmm. and harder. Um, but I think what we've done is we kind of said, let's expose an audience mm -hmm. to all of the different variables that exist, which are you know roughly 700, regardless mm -hmm. of who you use, Axiom, Epsilon, you know, uh, all those different companies. Let's look at, at what might be predictive. And in some mm -hmm. cases, what we found, Adam, from doing some home equity lines of credit, no one would have ever predicted this was if you owned an SUV, um, yeah. It was highly, it was like 70% likelihood that you were going to accept um, a home equity line of credit offer. Yeah. And who, who would have thought that was a correlation, right? So <laughs> right. rather than presume anything, let's let the data tell us who the best audience is and then mail that out or in a, today's world, right? Whether mm -hmm. that's electronic communication or whether that's traditional print communication, let's wait and see who responds. And then we'll go back and we'll assess what the key variables are that are driving response and interest. Yeah, it, it makes so much sense. And one of the things that I also think is interesting is kind of like the the evolution of, 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 of the company and what and how you've gone further to digital. So how did that because and the reason I'm asking you this question is because there's other companies out there that are in marketing and, or that may have other lines of market. They may not be 38 years old, right? And they may not have that robust bench, but they're still facing some of the same challenges that even large companies like yours face, which is, OK, the landscape's constantly changing changing? How do we make better decisions? How do we serve our clients better? So if that's the that's the context behind the next question, which is how did you kind of you've been there a long time? How did you navigate some of these changes into digital and otherwise to best serve your clients? Like what were some of those core things that that still make it work? Well, I will tell you, some of it was was hard. So it wasn't yeah. always, you know, it wasn't always a smooth migration. You know, I think we still struggle with some aspects. For example, um, we don't do media buying. So mm -hmm. um, we leave that to the experts. Uh, we kind of focus on what the data tells us and use yeah. that from a predictive perspective. And so a lot of clients get caught up on, hey, we're very close with our media buying agency. We mm -hmm. want to make sure that we're spending, you know, whatever the full budget is that we're allocated. Mm -hmm. And in our case, we come in and we're completely agnostic, right? To me, yeah. I don't care what channel you use, right? So if radio is working, phenomenal. If direct mail is working, great. If social influencers is working, wonderful mm -hmm. let's let the data though be prescriptive in telling us where we yeah. need to target that doesn't mean that we don't want to have an element of kind of crawl walk and run right we may want mm -hmm. to experiment with a facebook ad campaign using a lookalike clone model yeah. um, or, or maybe not so we've just tried to be very open and not presume anything as it re regards to what channel might work well because for one client it could be one application one platform one one you know, particular utilization. And mm -hmm. for another, it could be something completely different. Hmm. Yeah. And, and I, I, I'm glad to hear you struggle, not because I want you to struggle, by the way, Jim, it's just because all of us do like things are moving so right. fast. And right. I mean, if you add in some of the other things with AI and otherwise, and some of the other like the platforms that are coming up daily. Uh, what I like, though, about your process and the company's process is if you're letting the data kind of do the talking, then the and being agnostic, then the tool we already know is going to change over time. But the methodology and even I say this, you know, in a, in a nice way, but the training and I don't mean just the training of your staff and your, your company culture, but I mean also the clients that are used to working with you so that they know that if you're moving and, and you're testing one platform versus another, it's not because you don't know what you're doing. It's because it's in the culture. We want to see what that data is going to do or we want to see what the what the effect of running that particular campaign is going to be. Um, am I off on any of this? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but am I no, off on no, this? I think, you, I think you're spot on. You know, the, one of the things I, I would tell you, Adam, that is probably uh, a conversation we have frequently, and that is from mm -hmm. a lot of, I'll call less mature, uh, yeah. immature marketers or clients uh, new to database marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're trying to figure out, you know, hey, this is intimidating. And, and the landscape is yeah. shifting and moving so fast. I don't know what the proper allocation of budget is across all mm -hmm. the different channels that I can choose from. Fair. Um, and so they, they end up taking no action or mm -hmm. they default back to what they're comfortable with. 
Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that I would advocate anyone to increase their risk factor. But mm -hmm. what I would tell them is, you know what, you, you can, we'll call it dabble, we'll call it experiment, yeah. we'll yeah. call it test and learn, whatever you want. I, I think I like that, exploratory budget. That's my okay. like, <laughs> yeah, use 10% use, use of your exploratory yeah. budget and, and test a channel. And the great thing about digital in this environment, which is dramatically different from the 80s and 90s, is mm -hmm. that we can get a read in 24 to 48 hours. Yeah. And if our campaigns are achieving the results we want, if the audience that we are trying to target is the one that's responding, mm -hmm. then great. We know that. And, and we may go, you know, a little bit more in beyond our exploratory budget yeah. um, if, if things are working. And if they're not, we can pull back and, and we haven't, you know, lost that initial investment. Uh, it's mm -hmm. never too late to be able to do some shifts. Yeah. And, and the and the response time and to know if something's working, if you think about what you say, 24, maybe 48 hours, depending, right? Not uh, right. depending on what you're doing, depending on a lot. Right. I mean, I know there's a lot of variables, but any of those variables are going to be probably better than what we think about when we thought about the like on advertising, the beginning days where we're talking about, let's run this new play, newspaper ad and let's collect those coupons and let's right. clip them and let's, right. we'll sit, and we'll let's count, the, let's get to counting. Phone. Yeah. Sit by the phone and hope it rings. The origins of it all, right? But this yeah. is this is the progression of it to be able to see now. And so now when you think about like working on a campaign or something else and to know if it's working like that much faster, like I, I got to get into my these kids nowadays, Jim, and they're done. <laughs> That's me saying it, not you. You better, Adam. <laughs> oh, I couldn't help myself. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Um, I want to I want to get into some of the um, just some of the niches that you work with and, and over. I know I know you, by the way, I know as a company, you're, you're large, you can work with a variable and a lot of different clients from business owners to to governments. I mean, I think you literally work even in tourism and things like that. Like, like, talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. So um, we do work with a span of clients, you know, Fortune uh, 50 companies. And then mm -hmm. we work with very small companies that are uh, relatively new and trying to get their arms around ways that they can grow acquisition and, and things of that nature. So to us, really, uh, certainly budget's a factor. That's always one of, of the, the main qualifiers, right? So if, if someone says we have X to spend, we view our goal as spending that money as if it was our own, right? So we're mm -hmm. stewards of that budget. I wouldn't want to recommend anything to you that I wouldn't do myself. Yeah. Um, we are adamant, Adam, that it's all about measuring ROI. We hold mm -hmm. ourselves accountable. We expect our clients to hold us accountable. If we're not achieving what we had stated is the ROI or we're not helping you to better define your ROI, then mm -hmm. we're not do doing our job properly. But it's amazing to me the number of, of clients, large and small, that yeah. have gotten away from or are failing to recognize ROI. And you, mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. You talked about tourism. What drew us to this space in the late 2000s was the fact that so much money was being spent by state tourism offices mm -hmm. without any ROI. And so I don't want to pick on my home state. Mm -hmm. What does uh, that look like, by the way? Like when you yeah. say that, I want, yes. we're using a little bit of jargon. So I just want to like, what does that look like? When, yeah, what, what, so, could, I mean, or what could it look like? So, so if you take a, you know, I, I'm from Virginia and the Virginia okay. Tourism Corporation spends a healthy amount of money. It's not uh, uncommon uh, for most of our states in the U.S. to be spending certainly north of $10 million. Yeah. Um, you know, Visit Florida spends $40 million. Mm -hmm. So not insignificant sums of money. And so yeah, for us, I would how, say, <laughs> how, how are you, and especially in an environment like tourism, where yes. many of the entities, be they at a local level or be they at the state level, mm -hmm. are funded by legislatures. And those mm -hmm. legislatures, it's been surprising to me, again, why we were attracted to the industry, mm -hmm. have been really good about not holding their entities accountable, their yeah. uh, CBBs, DMOs, you know, state tourism offices. So I, good at spending the budget, not good at seeing is it working. Go ahead, continue. I said that, not there, you. Go there, ahead. There, there, is, <laughs> there is not as much of a focus on ROI. I, yeah. don't, I don't want to make a sweeping generalization. And the Agreed. next thing you get is a bunch of state tourism directors who said that guy had no idea what he was talking I'll about. I'll take that. That's okay. No, <laughs> there, I'll take is, that. They're not listening. It's fine. Go ahead. Uh, well, th there is <laughs> there is measurement. I, I, yeah. I don't want to I I infer that there is no measurement. I just don't think it's as accountable as it mm. is in some other traditional agencies where if we spend a dollar and we expected mm -hmm. a 3x return on that investment, how are we measuring that return? And part yeah. of the problem in tourism is because 
I, as a state, can market how wonderful my state is and how you, Adam, ought to come visit me. But it's very, very difficult for them to understand, does Jim Herenshaw ever show up in state XYZ? Oh, so yeah. it, it's hard to close the loop in tourism. Unlike on the hotel side, mm-hmm. Adam makes a reservation and we know that there was a head in the bed. For um, sure. But the state of Virginia, might you might have loved their ads and said to your, you know, whomever, friend, spouse, significant other, Virginia's cool. We've never been there. Let's go, yeah. you know, check out all these different things we can do. Um, but the state of Virginia never knows if you're there. Hmm. Yeah. We're trying to change that. We're trying to change that. And so what does that look like changing it? What does that look like? So, and what, what's so the we've difference? Been, we've, we've been very fortunate post, uh, I'm sorry, pre COVID mm-hmm. we were working, uh, with several technology partners on ways to be able to help entities, uh, mm-hmm. not just tourism destinations. So anybody can do this. Uh, by deploying two types of technology. The first is uh, something we call a smart pixel. It's Mm -hmm. the ability to place a pixel in the header of your website and then de-anonymize. Some people roll their eyes when I say that word. De-anonymize your website visitors. So we have the ability to be able to match that inbound visitor using a proprietary technology to say that that was Jim Herenshar. Jim was Mm -hmm. on our website at 9 p.m. last night. Here's the seven pages that he looked at. And then overlaying normative demographic data on top of that. So we can add age, income, presence of children, type of car you Mm -hmm. drive, do you own a house? What areas do you make philanthropic uh, uh, contributions and interests? Mm -hmm. 200 different variables that we can overlay on top of that. So now we are removing that anonymity around Mm -hmm. Are the people we are trying to drive to our website actually the ones that are coming to our website? And mm-hmm. we have we have dozens of examples, Adam, where the two didn't correlate. Someone was, go, someone was going after a 65-year-old male in a household that made over $200,000 and, in fact, was getting a 35-year-old female that made $75,000 or less. And so, you know, where is the accountability in terms of is our media plan working? Is our targeting working? Is our messaging mm-hmm. wrong? Is our ad creative wrong? The other thing that we're doing is using geoframing or geofencing mm-hmm. to be able to identify a mobile device as it walks inside that frame. So again, I'll use the state of Virginia, whether that's the entire state, whether that's Richmond where I live, whatever the case might be, the potential to build a geoframe and determine, hey, we've got this massive music festival mm-hmm. that occurs in the fall. And it goes for three days, but it's a free event. And we have no way of being able to know who really comes to that event. So Mm. as a destination marketer, you have the potential to build a frame around where that event is is, uh, being hosted and uh, and going on, and then de-anonymizing those visitors. Um, Mm. Again, we're not talking about matching 100% of the audience, but we're we're talking about matching north of 30% and in some cases over 50%. Well, in a world where historically people that's his, historically no, well it was nothing right like you could zero right <laughs> so n- now you have the ability to be able to identify who those folks are which is tremendous yeah. for building engagement with locals with those that are from a long way away across yeah. all kinds of different segments that we can build and all kinds of different demographics to be able to customize the creative the copy the offer the, the time mm-hmm. of mailing anything Hmm. You mentioned, um, you mentioned that first off, that's phenomenal because to go from zero to 30% or sometimes 50, as you mentioned, whatever that amount is to be able to be attribute that back is it lets you know, now, you know, where you can continue to invest spend and now you have something to, something to shoot for. Uh, you mentioned, you mentioned, um, heads and beds and tourism from another side of things like the hotel side of things. Do you do anything in, in kind of that space as well? Just curious. We do. Yeah. We work with a lot of the major brands that you would know of. And Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, we had a great opportunity to apply these types of learnings to do segmentation for one of the, you know, probably the most renowned and respected brands, two-time Malcolm Baldridge award-winning hotel chain. Mm. You want to hear more? I want to hear. Well, well, first off, do I get a discount? I mean, we're friends uh, or what? <laughs> if I could control that, Adam, you absolutely would. All right. Thank you. Hey, my mom told me you don't ask, you don't know. Go ahead. You don't get it. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you know, we, we were very fortunate to have been introduced to the folks at Ritz Carlton. And one of the things they wanted to try to understand was, does the booking performance of their guests vary based on the type of guest or the behavior of that guest, meaning that hmm. are they a business traveler? Um, so we, we took um, quite a large data set of past guests that they had uh, stay at their resort. 
plus mm -hmm. survey data. And we, we performed some analysis on top of that. And what we were able to define was nine different distinct segments mm. um, out of their data. And the top three, because it's hard to, to, to really action against nine segments, we decided to, to action against the top three. And they were three distinct segments. One was um, the, the well-traveled executive. It's the person who uh, stays at a Ritz-Carlton, typically in a downtown setting for business. Hmm. They typically book 60 days or less in advance. So the whole creative copy messaging strategy around that was very different from the opposite end of the spectrum, um, which was the person um, that was a resort. We called them a sun seeker. The hmm. sun seeker came for a week every year to almost the same resort or some other um, seaside resort, mm -hmm. and they would book 11 months in advance. And so again, the behavior of serving messages up and, and creative, the other thing that we found, which is, which was, I think a, a really neat kind of one of those things you, mm -hmm. you stumble upon, not by intent, but, but more by sheer luck. Um, had you thought about Ritz Carlton in the past, their advertising typically skewed towards the older upper income type individual. For sure. You might yeah. see a, you know, a husband and wife and a beautiful seaside scene. And we found in looking at the data that 72% of their audience had a child in the household under 18 years of age. Interesting. So we said, let's do some testing. Let's show kids on stand up paddle boards. Let's show kids building sandcastles at a uh, resort destination, a beach destination. Hmm. And it dramatically increased the booking rate um, and, and the frequency for that audience. Uh, so it was a great test. They ended up love to take credit for this, but they had a fabulous agency that they worked with, um, ended up developing all of the custom landing pages for each of those different segments that we were able to define. So the, mm. the, the sun seeker got a very different landing page than the well-traveled executive because the wow. needs of both of those That segmentation is insane. Yeah. Like it, but smart, but smart, I mean. Yeah, yeah. And this is, you know, that is something that anyone can do. That's, yeah. that's kind of why we underscore the value of data. Yeah. It does, as I said, it doesn't have to be super sophisticated data. Yes, you can have, you know, um, millions of data bits in, in, a, in AWS uh, or Azure uh, cloud. But by the same token, if, if you just have an Excel spreadsheet of a couple hundred, you're a small little boutique in bed and breakfast, mm -hmm. um, you can still do that same exercise by creating segments based upon uh, publicly available data and demographics that you can overlay on any type of file that you maintain. Man, that may, it makes so much sense when you say it. And and what's interesting to me is I, I think about it for a, a company as big as Ritz Carlton, but that same concept, just like you said, can be used by a small business owner if they have Absolutely. the right data, if they have the right thing. So maybe there was X amount of, of, um, of different landing pages that were made because they, you knew of the segmentation there, but even, you know, what's, what is that increase for the small business owner that has, that has maybe two or three that they kind of narrow down. It's, it's, it's not that much more work once you got the work, once you got the data and once you know what you're doing, like you're just doing, you're, you're obviously creating different campaigns, but you're like already there. <laughs> No, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, the only difference, honestly, Adam, is that you're looking at potentially millions of records versus hundreds or thousands yeah. of records. But, um, you know, the, the, the data remains the same in the sense of you have the ability to look at things like age, income, mm -hmm. you know, net worth, type of car you drive, type of, do you rent, do you own? You know, all of those are publicly available data points that you can yeah. go to any data compiler, request and overlay on your data it's all publicly uh, available. So we're not talking about PII, right? Nothing yep. that's not compliance and meets regulatory requirements in, in any of our 50 states. So mm -hmm. anybody can do that. Yeah. Jim, um, considering your knowledge, how long you've been in the industry and, uh, and the name of the company, like how many clients you've worked with, the size of clients otherwise, uh, what excites you right now? Just in your industry in general, in direct marketing, like what excites you? Like what, what's got you fired up right now? It could be technology, it could be anything. Yeah, I, I think from our from our perspective, um, one of the things that we're always asked when I when I speak, I'm asked, you know, kind of to be a futurist. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I wish I had that crystal ball, Adam, because I, I'd like to think I'd probably be a wealthier person. I don't know if I could <laughs> if I could predict the outcome um, of a lot of different things. But uh, I find, you know, where we're going with AI uh, mm -hmm. to be both extremely enticing, but also mm -hmm. a bit scary. Um, yeah. 
I'll tell you, you know, when we talked about our technology, smart pixel and bullseye, I have a lot of people that say to me, you know, that they call that the creepy pixel, right? They're like, oh yeah, I've, I've heard about you guys, creepy pixel technology. Oh, uh, and yeah, that's I cold, mean, man. That's, that's bad branding. Bad. I don't like it. I no, uh, no. How no, about the precise no. pixel? Go ahead. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, I like the precise pixel. And we're going to change it. Go ahead. <laughs> so I, I think that that what excites me is the fact that. You know, we have so many different channels now. Um, mm -hmm. What what works for you may not work for me in terms of our two companies, right? Mm -hmm. And so, if I find that social influencers are highly effective for me, now we can do the analysis to determine that. We can still mm -hmm. segment our audience, and we can figure, okay, which of our audience segments is going to best relate to a social influencer, and right. that's how we'll 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 heavy up in there. So being able to better utilize and kind of build the word around what's working for us with these technologies and not be afraid of them. AI is, you know, just another really, I mean, if, if we think about words that we've used in the industry for a long, long time, um, you know, machine learning was before AI and before machine learning, it was big data. Uh, yeah. And so we just kind of rebrand a lot of these technologies. I do think AI will take us beyond what those other things, but I also think there's a scary side to AI too. So mm. I, I think as an industry, marketers collectively, we need to be very careful of that. Amazing. Um, final question, Jim, if somebody wants to continue the conversation, follow up with your team, learn more about the company and, uh, and think about marketing and, and, and what they could, what, how they could benefit, um, what's the best way for people to reach out? Yeah, great. Thanks, Adam. So what we've actually put together is a landing page for your audience um, with a uh, available discount for Mission yeah. Matters viewers and, and subscribers. You can find that at www. Uh, dot uh, or slash RMG, as in Robert Mary George dash USA dot mm -hmm. com with a forward slash Mission Matters. So RMG dash USA dot com forward slash Mission Matters. Perfect. And for everybody listening, just so you know, we'll put that link in the show notes. So you can just click on the link and head right on over. And uh, speaking of the audience, if this is your first time with Mission Matters and you haven't hit the subscribe or the follow button yet, we welcome you to do so. This is a daily show. Each and every day we're putting out new content, new ideas, and hopefully new entrepreneurial stories that are going to help you along the way in your journey as well. So again, hit that subscribe or follow button. And uh, Jim, again, really appreciate you coming out. And, and and sharing all that knowledge with us. So thank you so much. Thanks, Adam. Been a lot of fun.